All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. Uh, thanks for joining us this week um, for our every other week AMSSM Sports Ultrasound case series. Um, so today uh, we're fortunate to have uh, Pierre Demacourt here to um, to give a, a, a or present a case to us. Um, just a quick bit of background um, on on Pierre. So he's he's originally emergency medicine trained. Uh, he did his uh, sports medicine fellowship out at Boston Children's, which is where he currently is. He serves the role as the uh, sports ultrasound director out there, and um, he is, uh, like I said, a sports medicine physician out in out in Boston. So Pierre is actually going to be talking about um, a, a, a particular case of a hip labrum tear in a patient with some borderline dis, uh, hip dysplasia as well, which I, I think is going to be quite interesting. So with that, I will give it over to uh, Pierre. Great. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for the opportunity to talk. Um, it's really a, a, a favorite topic of mine. Um, let me get to my slides here. So I already hit share screen. <laughs> I don't see my slides. Yeah, I'm not seeing them yet. Okay, great. There they are. Can you see everything in there? Uh, we cannot. Do you want me to go back on? Uh, I'll, uh, I'll try to yeah, stop and then reshare. You see that? Yep, there we go, got it. Okay. Okay, great. So um, I have no disclosures and um, I wanted to say a special thanks to the uh, hip team at the, the Boston Children's. Um, there's a sort of a multidisciplinary group that's been meeting for almost 10 years now on Thursday mornings and discussing and collaborating on cases, and even with some uh, outside the hospital surgeons as well come in to participate. Um, Mike Millis, who started the hip preservation program at uh, Children's, really got this whole idea going. And uh, so there's the open hip surgeons, the, the ones that do the PAOs, there's the Arthroscopic surgeons, there's the uh, all uh, my ultrasound partners are, are working with it and physical therapists. And then we have a lot of the athletic trainers that help uh, work with us. So it's a pretty neat group. And um, so um, these are some of the things that we have been doing on, and I'll um, go through it. Um, uh, my objectives are basically to review some of that pertinent anatomy and to discuss um, some of the other imaging and the complementary imaging to ultrasound and review a case, of course, of uh, someone with anterior hip pain and use this case to basically uh, go through the protocol for the anterior hip examination by AIUM. And then we'll discuss the utility in different circumstances for using the dynamic exam. And, and we have some sort of newer dynamic exams that may or may, or may, or may not be helpful. And then uh, review the, um, the, the report. So just going through some of the anatomy, um, what you want to do is some of the bony things because the bony things are the things that you can recognize right away and uh, they jump right out at you as your, at your home base. And so knowing the uh, anterior superior iliac spine where the sartorius attaches and very particularly where the rectus attaches, which is, as you can see is right above the, uh, uh, humeral, uh, the uh, femoral head right here and can actually cause a subspine impingement itself and, and is where the rectus can get into trouble um, from time to time. And then you've got the uh, uh, iliopectomial line with the psoas has to go over and can um, be an issue, but it's a good home base to sort of look at the, at the psoas when you're, when you're there. And then the um, lesser trochanter is important because of course the psoas goes down there and you have to recognize that the, the psoas really has to make this really arduous course. So it comes all the way down from the uh, uh, T12 and um, uh, joins the iliacus and then inserts uh, posteriorly. So it actually flexes and externally rotates um, the hip. Um, then the acetabulum uh, it of course has the gasket, which is the labrum and that helps seal and, and keep the, um, the uh, uh, tight seal there. 
Then there's the capsule. And then I think for people that are interested in any of the uh, micro instability, which I am, um, there's the iliofemoral ligament, which is a large uh, Y-shaped ligament where the anterior fibers are very vertical. The posterior fibers are not are more horizontal, but it really uh, gives you a lot of anterolateral stability to the hip. And you know, perhaps some of the people with, with Ehlers-Danlos and people that are subluxing a lot um, need work with that. And there are certain regenerative techniques that sometimes can be used for that. Um, then you have the uh, rectus femoris, which comes up, and this isn't the greatest uh, uh, an, an anatomic uh, uh, specimen, but basically what happens is you have the direct head here, and then you have the reflected head, and that's the important one to remember because we see that um, get into trouble a lot, particularly when you start moving bones around with the PAO, and I, I've seen a bunch of reflected head problems with uh, people that have had total hip arthroplasty. Um, getting a lot of uh, pain and um, and calcification right in that area there. And, so, and looking at it's not the easiest thing in the world, um, as we'll try to demonstrate in a few minutes. Um, so that's the reflected head that you want to um, keep an eye on. And then the other thing is, of course, the, ilio, uh, the iliopsoas. And so you've got this large triangular uh, iliacus muscle that comes down and joins with the psoas uh, to, again, insert right where the lesser trochanter is. Um, and the pectineus is just outside that. But predominantly, you know, when you're doing the anterior exam, you're sort of examining it in a fairly small window right here between the rectus and the psoas muscle right in that area there. Um, so when you have hip pain, I think one of the first things that I try to categorize the patient into is, is this a hip pain patient or is this a hip preservation patient? And I think that you can get an MRI and it really won't tell you what that what the story is. I think what I want to always see very first is a is a good standing AP pelvis, and it it has to be standing in my mind because if it's if it's a supine film, you may not have that same weight bearing that may pull a little bit more out on the femoral head so that you get a little bit more dysplastic types of changes. So. And when I'm thinking dysplasia, I always want to make sure that I get a standing AP, and then I'll usually get a false profile view, and uh, then we get the done view. And I'm not sure you always have to get all of those, but I always, if I'm going to get an X-ray, I always get a standing AP, and then it sort of depends on how the patient's doing. I may uh, add the other ones in, but those are the three X-rays that will tell me a lot about whether it's a hip preservation patient or not, and um, fairly easy um, to get. Um, the uh, and had one other. Uh, so in that light, I wanted to just bring out the point that the lateral center edge angle, it's important that that's above 25. So there's some controversy in the literature, but if you have a lateral center edge angle greater than 25, that's normal. 20 to 25 is in that sort of borderline zone. Some people say down to 18. And then below 20, it starts to get more serious. And he, uh, Murphy did the study that showed that if you have it less than 16, you have ba basically 100% chance of having osteoarthritis by the age of 60. And then the anterior center edge angle from the false profile view should be about 20. So this is a young man, 18-year-old uh, college freshman with a two-year history of anterior hip pain. And mostly came on with running. He's not a huge runner, but he runs recreationally. He's not uh, specifically an athlete. Um, no trouble sleeping. Otherwise, his past medical history was negative. Uh, but his mother, who was a pediatrician in our community, um, I had diagnosed with a, a, a dysplasia. Uh, it was a borderline dysplasia, but it was uh, pretty significant. And she ended up getting a PAO four months ago. And then about two months ago, she brought her daughter to me who also has dysplasia and more uh, more significant dysplasia. So the differential diagnosis was narrowing very quickly. Um, and um, so uh, on physical findings, he uh, had a positive fader, but he also had a positive apprehension test, which is when you extend, uh, uh, adduct, and externally rotate. And if that causes anterior pain, that's more consistent with uh, instability. It causes posterior pain, it's posterior impingement uh, many times. Um, the only other thing I, I bring up is that he had a lot, a big crossover in his gait. So he, he brought me a little video of his running and he had, from a, a rear view, he had some crossover, which was probably additive to that as well. Um, he at school, he had had an MRI that showed labor care, but there was no x-rays done at all. So when I saw him, um, I, I got some x-rays. And as you can see here, not bad. He's got a, a lateral center range angle of 21 and a, but a anterior center range angle of 15. So 
fairly unstable, and he was getting some delamination on the MRI right at the chondrolateral juncture, um, sort of indicating that this, you know, maybe he was pushing a little hard on that anterior portion because of the uncoverage. Un un so um, now we decided to do an ultrasound, of course, and um, so I'm going to go through the basic protocol. And um, most of the people that I see doing this really start with the femoral head, neck, acetabulum, long axis, and then short axis. Um, and then move to the tendons around that area. I typically start at the rectus, I, and you know, it's just my own thing. I think um, Marnix taught, taught me that um, uh, many years ago, and and then I move more medially into the uh, femoral head, neck, and then to the psoas, etc. But anyway, so you want to kind of get a good idea of the femoral head, and neck, and then look at the rectus, psoas, sartorius, all with uh, two orthogonal views. And that's the, the major part of the exam, but then you can add different things. Number one, if you have uh, you, some abnormalities and you want to check it out, you do, don't forget that you have bilateral um, asides. And so when I work with Dr. Millis, it takes me forever to get through the exam because he always makes me start do a complete exam on the opposite side and then come back and do the, uh, one on the affected side. So uh, it can take some time. Um, uh, and don't forget the dynamic exam, and you will go through some of those dynamic things that you can actually do. And um, if I get concerned about there being something more medial, don't forget that you know you can go on over into a medial exam if you're thinking sports hernia or if there's the lateral hip if you're uh, thinking that that's part of it. And lots of times you have that sort of C shaped pain, so you're going to uh, probably end up doing that. I probably end up doing a lot of lateral hip exam uh, at the same time. Um, so then the rectus, um, basically, you know, I started in a pretty uh, sagittal plane um, and I put my probe right over the uh, a a -I -I -S, and then to me what I have to do is kind of take the uh, distal end of my probe and sort of swing it till I get right over a good picture of the uh, rectus tendon uh, insertion there. And then uh, when I go to want to get to the uh, reflected head, it's you kind of have to curve it and tuck it down and, and many times you're kind of tilting it uh, to get a good view of the reflected head. And so here you go. His, this is the young man who, uh, this was his direct head. And then as I come laterally, you can start to see the reflected head come down a bit. And then bringing my probe way down, you could actually see parts of that coming straight down to the acetabulum. And where that is, is right as it comes under glute men and glute med over that, and then the TFL, uh, the, the uh, TFL over the top of that. And, um, and, and, and don't forget that when the scope goes in, um, when they do an arthroscope, they're bringing that medial portal right through here. So one of the areas after a, an arthroscopic surgery where you can have a, a lot of uh, scar tissue and sometimes adhere it to the capsule is right below the rectus, which can cause pain and, and, and stiffness um, with motion of the joint. Um, this is the short axis view. If I turn 90 degrees and I get to the AIIS, and to recognize this, I just come down over the femoral, round femoral head. I see the nice round femoral head. I'm in an axial plane and then just translate more proximally so you get to that uh, bony bump that comes right up, then you know you're right at the uh, rectus and the insertion with the reflected head coming down in, in this area here. And you can follow it all the way down um, into the full rectus. Um, lots of times when I have somebody that's had a lot of uh, postoperative scar tissue and I can't even figure out what the rectus is, or many times in a total hip replacement, I go right down to the middle of the rectus, find the central slip, and then just work my way up, and then I can figure out where, where I need to go from there. So then I turn my probe to a sagittal oblique plane, and I'm looking at the femoral head neck juncture uh, here. And so you'll get a view of this, and there's the, um, you're going to see the femoral head neck juncture. The capsule is really two layers. What the capsule is, um, starts, of course, at the acetabulum, comes down to the intertropenteric line, and that's the thickest part of it. And then it uh, comes back along the inner lining of the hip and stops about here. And one thing to know about that is if you stick a needle, if you have to put a needle in the joint for any reason, if you come in here, it, sometimes you get caught between the two layers. And that's why it's always best to go right about this area here that you, you're you more accurate in getting through and you, you don't have to worry about, you know, pulling the needle back and forth. 
but you want to look for an effusion. And so an effusion is, pro, you know, can be up to seven millimeters, but in, in most cases, it's a, a, about four millimeters. Sometimes you can't tell the difference between an effusion and synovitis. And the, if, if that's the case, if you compress it, uh, synovium is using that too compressible, whereas fluid is, is a good bit more compressible. Um, the synovium, of course, is the inner lining of, on, the, on the capsule there. And if you think that that's what's inflamed, you can always, always use your Doppler flow uh, a, as well. And of course, you can look at the labrum here. You have a labral tear. You can look at the capsule all the way up and down. And just as a note about postoperative arthroscopic pain, um, when you uh, put the scope in, um, you're coming in under the rectus uh, with that medial portal, and then you're going to uh, cut through the capsule. So when you're cutting through the capsule here, it, in the old days, like 10 years ago, they didn't even close it, but that was uh, found to be um, more related to some instability and more post-operative pain. Some people actually went on to PAOs because of it, um, a, a periostabular osteotomy. So uh, it's good to, in that sagittal big plane, go from one side to the other and look at that whole capsule, particularly in a post-operative uh, patient, then you can really get a good um, view of that. And you can look for loose bodies in here. I had a lady the other day, um, I should have brought those images, but she had the, she had some chondral bodies uh, in, the, uh, in, uh, in the hip that were, may have been causing some discomfort. Um, and I just brought this up here. My, I have a very sensitive computer. I just touch it and it just goes to the next one. I just brought this a kid I saw like two days ago, and I, and I thought it was nice just to show you where you can see the physis right here. So you've got nice thick cartilage because the cartilage you want to sort of assess in uh, particularly older folks because they're the ones that are getting into trouble. But the uh, this is a good view of the cartilage. There's the physis, and I just make a point. One of the reasons why uh, kids that are active in hockey may be getting cams is because they're constantly banging this the, this physis here against the rim, and that might cause that hypertrophy of the uh, cam, at least that's one theory. Um, so uh, that's one thing. And so again, post-operative hip pain, you want to look for capsular integrity, both intra and extra articular scar tissue, um, and then instability, which I'm going to show you some, some uh, interesting instability stuff that we're doing. And, um, and then look for recurrent labral tear as well as uh, a cam. So coming out more uh, posterior laterally, tilting your probe, you can sometimes see a recurrent cam um, after surgery. Um, and then go to the short axis view. And this is this is not that patient. I just put this in here because this is another patient of mine that I've been having a hard time with, but she's been getting better. But basically, here's a short axis view where she's got both intraarticular scar tissue and subrectus scar tissue. And we, we uh, after this, we actually uh, hide her dissected right up in this through this area here to try to help her because she was really stiff and getting um, any kind of, of motion there. Um, then, of course, you want to look at the labrum, and uh, again, here's his labrum, a little suggestion of a tear right there. This was not him. This was, I just put this in here to show a paralabral cyst um, that can many times be associated with a, uh, a labral tear. Um, and then you go with a, a long axis, short axis views of the psoas, and I, sometimes I can get it in one view, but, but here's with, with that young man. I started up in the pelvis. I like to get up high and start, look, look to make sure there's nothing, uh, cysts or ganglions or anything up in, in that area, and then work my way down. So here you're up in the, in the pelvis, there's the acetab and the femoral head. And as I came down, this is over the femoral head, and then this is all the way down at the insertion of, of the uh, lesser trochanter. And it's important to look all the way down there. It doesn't happen a lot, but you can get a tear, um, tendinopathy, and, and, and tendinopathy probably occurs right in this location, far more common than we, we think. And I've, I've been doing radial, uh, radial and focus shockwave uh, therapy on some of that right there and had some really good success with that uh, as, a, as a different orthobiologic uh, intervention. Um, so then I go short axis on the psoas. Um, what you're going to do is you're going to find, again, in an axial plane, just like this probe is right here, you're going to find the round head and then uh, femoral head and then translate more proximally to get um, right in here. And you've got the uh, AIS and the, there's the uh, uh, tendon there. But then what you've got is the psoas and iliacus. Um, this is the psoas tendon here. And what you have, you have, these are the uh, more medial fibers of the iliacus muscle. And then you have the more lateral fibers of the iliacus muscle, which is out over here coming up along the uh, inner border of the ilium here. And this is the area they say is much more prone to tearing. And I think, you know, in a couple of cases, I've seen um, some bad tears of the myotendinous area. Um, it's, it's been in this area right here. 
Um, so here's an example. This is a different patient just looking at the, uh, uh, this is actually somebody I just saw about three, about a month ago. And um, she had a tear, but it looked pretty good. But where she, her tear was right at the distal end of the uh, psoas, uh, where it inserts on the lesser troke. And I don't know if you can appreciate it, but it was a little tear right here, which corresponded um, with an MRI finding that was from, at another facility. And I ended up just putting a little PRP into that area there. And she's doing better. Um, she has some motor dysfunction due to some nerve issues, but um, doing, doing well from the tendon standpoint. Uh, I, I just pulled this out because I suddenly realized just I forgot to put the, put the sartorius in, but uh, the sartorius isn't a common area, in my opinion, of um, uh, problems. Uh, even with kids, kids have the apophysis there, so they do occasionally get an apophysitis there. But the uh, in adults, I don't see it very often, but you can see it, and you'll see some uh, thickening and some hypo uh, changes that will occur right in that area there. So that's an important part of the exam, too. Now, uh, snapping so So this is a girl I saw from the West, Midwest, uh, Tuesday, and um, 12 years old, had this really bad pain that's been going on for a long time, and uh, questionable labral tear, but um, had a lot of snapping. And this is not the greatest snap that you will see, but I, I'm almost, it was, I could see the snap happen, and it was, uh, it was so no palpably tender, and that's right uh, where her pain was. And by the way, I meant to mention that I, you know, whenever I examine any of these tendons, I, I, I make a note whether it's sonopalpably tender or not, because it makes a big difference because it may just be an incidental finding. Um, so here you go. Let me see if I can demonstrate this. So when she flexed up, she just simply flex it up and drop it down. And you it would go up and it would pop down right on the uh, iliopectineal line. And uh, do that one more time. So as she flexed up, it goes up into the muscle belly, and then it comes down, boom. And that's when she gets her pain. So um, I was going to inject it, but she was 12 years old, had a lot of anxiety. I, I believe that yesterday, uh, I, she had to get something else with IR, so it, they required sedation. So um, I think in, um, interventional radiology I did that yesterday. Um, so then we get to dynamic instability, which is really kind of an interesting topic. Um, and I, I remember about 10 years ago, working with Mike Millis, we were doing some um, uh, rounds on some patients. And he, uh, he said to me, he said, what can we do to try to figure out this micro instability thing? And so we're just sitting there and there's a, there's a bunch of us around. And so finally, we, we, I sat down and I, I said, well, let's just see what happens. And uh, because he kept talking about the apprehension position, let me just see what happens when you do that. So um, we, in the neutral position, this is what you see. So this is the apprehension position. But before you get there, if you're just laying down supine, um, this is actually from the kid that uh, I'm, I'm talking about. So this is the actual case. Um, we're in the neutral position. Uh, there's the tip of the acetabulum, okay, and so and so the femoral head just rises a little above it, no big deal. That's uh, you can have that easily. But then when we put him into extension and external rotation, he popped up about uh, ten millimeters, which no one knows exactly what the numbers are yet. But that seems more than we typically see. Now I've seen more than that with no symptoms, and you know I, I go out and do the physicals at the uh, uh, Walnut Hill Dance School and high school and uh, some of those kids move easily one not a ton of them but a few of them do so you, it's all just another piece of information in your whole thought process and then recently we started uh doing um the uh doing this in a standing position so this is that same girl with the psoas uh no i'm sorry this is, is a different this is a girl with ehlers danlos syndrome who uh she's like 21 and um she's got this painful hip um but really doesn't want surgery she's got a little label tear but uh, in, this is in the standing position. Um, she's got uh, instability uh, popping out. So that's and that's the most supportive that she actually is sublux. She feels it sublux, and you can look and, and see it sublux, which um, I think is interesting. And then this is her in the supine position, and I'll see if I can demonstrate that. Just actually, this just shows the dynamic of it. Um, so, you know, I'm just going, going, doing the apprehension position and relaxing it and just doing it again. This was, this was, yeah, this was yesterday. Um, so, you know, and most people don't do that. And if you take a look at a lot of people, most people would stay fairly solidly in there. 
Uh, but a lot of these EDS kids um, uh, have more problem with that. And then the other uh, finding that I uh, found, uh, Marnix taught me this a, a number of years ago, was to do the anterior hip impingement where you have your probe basically in an axial position like this, keeping your eye on the femoral head. So this is this is actually the left hip because there's the acetabulum. And um, then what you're doing is you're going to um, internally rotate it. Let me see, I slow that down. Um, and you're gonna look for any kind of soft tissue, i.e. labrum getting pushed up there. But what I find is that I, this I always get thrown up. Plus, as you can see here, I'm not at 90 degrees. I can get to about 80, sometimes I can get up to 90. So what I looked at doing was um, doing it from the anterolateral position. So if you, if you take your probe to the top of the trochanter and put it in the coronal plane and then tilt the top of it about 30 degrees forward, um, what happens is, is that you can actually see, so this is the acetabulum right here. This is the soft tissue labrum. This is the trochanter. This is the neck and this is the head. Uh, it takes a little bit to learn this, but when you see it, it's just so much better than the other way of actually looking for any kind of uh, impingement uh, um, problems. So the ultrasound report now, it doesn't necessarily have to include all, some of those other uh, dynamic maneuvers because some of those are, are, are not you know, uh, standard yet, of course. Um, but so uh, you should make a comment on, on the basic findings that you have. So I um, you know, put, you know, that we did a diagnostic ultrasound of the right hip and the indications were it was an 18 year old male with uh, hip pain running and signs of borderline dysplasia. Uh, you, what kind of probe I use, and then my findings and, and put in that I correlated it with the x-rays and the MRIs that I had seen before. And then I put down that the femoral head uh, joint looked intact. There was no effusion. Um, there was a label tear, and there was some uh, um, uh, the subrectus space. Hold on one second. I got to move everything around. I can't see. <laughs> uh, the capsule uh, was normal. Uh, on, on dynamic exam, though, there did appear to be excessive motion, possibly indicating some micro-instability. And then I made a comment about the rectus, and even though it wasn't tender sonopalpably, uh, there was a few changes there. And then the psoas looked normal, long and short axis, and the sartorius was normal. And in the conclusion, just make the statement about you know, the, the labral tear and um, the instability, and that there was some mild tendinosis. Um, so that's kind of what we do. Um, All right, thanks, Sorry. thanks, thanks, Pierre. That was great. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I know for for me, I don't see uh, that's not true. I see a decent amount of of post operative hip um, patients after PAO and and whatnot, and you know, not an infrequent number, at least the ones that I see will will have some you know subjective complaints of instability and. You know, for all the world, surgically everything looked looked fine, and maybe some post-op um, MR scans look okay. But you know, I've using ultrasound, I've I've caught a couple patients that have you know maybe some subtle capsular insufficiency, um, or even some you know some subtle peripheral labral pathology resulting in in some um, some complaints um, and, and findings of instability, and so and that's where I think you know, like you mentioned, the dynamic nature of ultrasound can be really helpful um, to, to identify these patients that are having some of the, the micro instability, you know, with, with macro instability, you know, for the most part, your physical exam is going to be able to, to capture that. But these, these cases of subtle, you know, micro instability, uh, I think ultrasound can be, can be really helpful. And then, you know, the other thing that you mentioned, and I've said this before, and Doug has said this a thousand times, you know, I always comment on stonal palpatory pain. I think it's incredibly helpful um, because like you mentioned, you know, we see some of these abnormal findings all the time and it doesn't necessarily mean that they're, you know, symptomatic for the patient. So I, I always comment on, um, on a stonal palpation um, a pain provocation. Um, Doug, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, Pierre, um, <clears throat> really nicely done. Um, just a couple of anatomic points, and then I have a question for you about instability. But, um, you know, for me, I, there's a, there is a fair amount of literature on hip effusions with ultrasound, and, and there's as much literature refuting numbers as there is supporting numbers. And so 
probably like you, Pierre, for me, um, they have a hip effusion if I see fluid. And if I, you know, I do the same thing as if it's compressible, it's fluid. If it's not, it's, it's probably thickened tissue, i.e. synovitis. Um, and so I don't really use a number of the anterior recess to um, determine whether there's an effusion or not. If I see fluid, there is. And if I don't, there isn't. Um, you know, the, you also um, pointed out uh, correctly that, you know, the rectus um, it, it is a little more complex than it seems. Um, so for those just getting started, uh, the central tendon, which is the most vulnerable tendon for rectus tears, um, actually becomes the reflected head. And it's the superficial aponeurosis that becomes the direct head. Um, so it's not quite intuitive. And then again, you, you nicely point out that the iliopsoas is a complex. And, and so we should think of it as a complex. Um, and it has a fair amount of heterogeneity. Um, and so if you're someone who's doing a lot of uh, anterior hip exams and looking for a snapping tendon, I mean, sometimes you don't see a predominant psoas major tendon. Sometimes it can be bifed. Um, and there's often times direct attachment of muscle uh, onto the femur. And so I, it's just important to be aware that there's a fair amount of heterogeneity of the iliopsoas tendon complex, as, as we say. Um, so Pierre actually showed me his, his uh, dynamic exam a few years ago, and, and I've been playing around with it. Um, Pierre, have you done any sort of uh, study or even just informal study looking at normals compared to people that you feel have micro instability? Uh, not yet. What happened just before the pandemic, we got all the reliability done and then everything shut down. But now actually we just had a meeting like two weeks ago. And so we're looking at that in a very short order, like within the next few weeks, we're going to start looking at that. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I mean, again, since you show me that I, I, I do that on some patients and, and just play around with it a little bit. And, and I've, I've done it on some people that are asymptomatic. Um, you know, let's say they come in uh, uh, a younger patient, usually older patients are ref for lateral hip pain, I see. But, you know, occasionally we have a younger patient with lateral hip pain or even a snapping, let's say, iliopsoas or IT band. So we're not really worried about the hip joint. But I've, I've played around with it a few times. And I have to say that, you know, there are, I, I think, a number of people who have a fair amount of uh, you know, change, you know, that it's hard for me to know then, you know, what is clearly abnormal or not. And so I think that that approach would be really useful. I think it's just another, so it, this young guy that we presented, so he's got borderline displays, he's got a labral tear, and he moves a fair amount. So if you're going to do an arthroscope on him versus a PAO, because that will come up as a discussion, would you just reef the capsule real well or use cadaver graft to, to reef it? And I, so the, the meaning of it is sort of like, I think we need to know more, like you just said, about exactly what's normal and not normal, but as just a piece of information to go with it, all the other radiographic findings, uh, I think it even right now would have some meaning for the intervention if he has intervention. Mm -hmm. Right, right. You know, the, 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 one, the one patient that absolutely is maddening for me is that one that has this sort of deep anterior click, you know, and, and you sit there with the probe and you try to find it, you can try to find it, you move the probe different ways and you just can't see it and, and they can demonstrate it. I don't know if you have any insights to that, but I find those maddening sometimes. Well, they, everyone thinks it's the labrum. Occasionally it is, but it's not very common, I don't think. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, it, 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 it's certainly you've uh, created a niche. You see a lot of patients with this. You're very good at it. Um, and we look forward to learning more information on micro instability. I'll make sure we get that study going. Thank you. Hey, Pierre, can I just ask one quick question before sure. we end this? Um, <clears throat> so when, I, when I'm doing dynamic scans for, for anterior hip instability, I, I'm almost always doing them. Um, supine and trying to provoke symptoms, you know, with that hip extended abducted, externally rotated position. And, and you had shown on your case, you know, trying to provoke instability symptoms, both, I'm sorry, supine, both supine as well as um, um, standing. What have you seen, you know, comparing the two approaches in terms of, of sensitivity to, to capture micro instability or, or, or provoke symptoms? Is, is one better than the other that you've seen or, or are they comparable? Well, it, in my mind, 
the standing one makes more sense because you know then you're actually replicating what they're going through on a daily basis um so it's one of the, that exam we just started uh recently so it, it, we haven't got a ton of data yet on that so uh, we'll get back to you as we get more and more information. We're also looking at post year instability too. If you, um, I, I didn't want to go there because it's not this uh, talks about, but if you put them in the lateral to cubist position and flex, adduct, and internally rotate, but, and before that you get them sort of in a neutral position and watch it pop out back, I think some of these EDS kids will come back out. And so, of course, if you've got, you know, retroversion with poor coverage posteriorly of the acetabulum bony wise, and then you're popping out because of some ligamentous laxity um that wasn't part of your question you're i would say i would say intuitively i think the standing one is better um but you know we have the most data on the apprehension test at this point in time great thank you i, I, I appreciate that um all right well thanks again pierre that was that was fantastic incredibly um informative and, and educational so thanks so much for for hopping on and, and doing that with us today. Oh, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. All right. So that is that is it. We're off next week back on the 15th of October. Um, Dr. Adam Smarski is going to be giving a talk on ulnar nerve instability at the elbow. Um, otherwise, everybody have a great, uh, great Friday, great weekend. We'll see you in a couple of weeks.